When a major news story breaks anywhere in the world, there are certain things a journalist can count on. Hundreds and maybe thousands of reporters and photographers will be converging on the scene, fighting each other for plane reservations and hotel rooms. And amidst all this confusion, there will be one, and probably two, red-headed American photographers named Turnley right in the middle of the action. Besides being identical twins and two of the best photojournalists in the world, they are also each other's best friend and toughest competitor. You may never have seen or heard of them until now, but it's almost certain at one time or another you've caught a glimpse of the world through their eyes. Between them, they have covered every major news story of the past 15 years. The Gulf War, Somalia, Rwanda, South Africa, Chechnya, Haiti, the West Bank, and the Gaza Strip. David Turnley is the oldest by about three minutes, a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer for the Detroit Free Press. His photo of an American soldier grieving the death of his best friend is perhaps the most famous of the Gulf War. Peter Turnley isn't eligible for the Pulitzer Prize since he works for a magazine, but he has won lots of other awards and his pictures have graced the cover of Newsweek more than 30 times. And for many of their colleagues in the media, the true measure of a story's importance is whether it's a one or a two Turnley story, like Tiananmen Square, where their very presence was enough to temporarily distract several million Chinese from the business at hand. It happened that David and I were right next to each other on ladders. And suddenly I noticed that with this million crowd of students that there's kind of this rippling effect that almost became frightening of faces that are turning looking towards us. And I realized that they were looking at us. And I turned to David and say, geez, Dave, I guess they really do think we all look alike. They spend most of their lives doing everything they can not to look alike. When we talked to them in Paris, Peter on the right had grown a beard. But they're so used to being mistaken for one another that they're not above using the mix-ups to their own professional advantage. Here's an example. David got his big break covering South Africa and spent three years there cultivating a close relationship with Winnie Mandela. When it was reported that her husband Nelson was finally about to get out of jail, Peter ended up in South Africa too, along with about a hundred other reporters and photographers clamoring for a picture or an interview with Winnie after she met with her husband in prison. And I find myself right next to her. She's getting in the car and she stops and she reaches out and hugs me and says, hello, David. I make a nice picture and of course I didn't correct it. I wasn't David. Later in the car, David was driving the car and I could see smoke coming out of his ears and I chided him. I said, don't worry, Dave. When Nelson gets out, I'll try to get you into the house. If they sometimes reap each other's rewards, they can also pay for each other's mistakes. Like the time David flew into Israel and drove immediately to the West Bank to cover an uprising in Ramallah, only to be arrested on site by an outraged Israeli military officer. And he's, uh, he's telling me that, uh, you know, I'm really in, in, in serious uh, trouble this time, that I've been abusing his authority for so long and I said, oh please, I understood exactly what was going on. I said, please, you don't understand, I have a twin brother um, and you've been running him out of here for the last seven weeks and I just arrived and I don't really know the rules of the game yet. And he says, oh no, that's an original story. While they found professional success separately, their career paths, like their genes, are virtually identical. Both are graduates of the University of Michigan, both majored in French literature and have degrees from the Sorbonne. And now, after a decade of living on different sides of an ocean, both reside in Paris a few blocks away from each other. But they grew up about as far away from the left bank as you can get. Fort Wayne, Indiana, to be exact. Their father, Bill, was an orthodontist, their mother, Betty, a piano teacher. And both did their best to steer dinner conversations to the civil rights movement and world affairs. But until they were 17, the only thing the twins wanted to hear about was football. We were both known to be pretty tough football players. We were linebackers and uh, used to have a lot of fun when uh, during a high school football game, the announcer would say, tackle by the Turnleys, because we both, we both would have hit a guy at the same time. And it was football, or more precisely a football injury, that turned the Turnley brothers to photography. 
Peter tore a ligament his junior year and was out for the season. His parents bought him a camera to keep him occupied and later helped him set up a dark room. If he had scored five touchdowns, he wouldn't have been as excited as he was about that developing image that he saw in the, in the tanks. And to no one's surprise, David became interested too. They spent the next year and a half driving around taking pictures in one of Fort Wayne's poor neighborhoods, a culturally and racially mixed area along McClellan Street. We decided in our own humble way to take our one camera and one lens and together try and document life on this street. One of us would inevitably uh, sort of end up babysitting the children for somebody's family while the other went off with the camera and then he would come back a couple hours later when he sort of was tired and we'd hand off the camera. At the end of the year, everyone on McClellan Street had a photo album and the Turnley brothers had a professional portfolio of their work. Without telling their parents, David took his first plane flight and began knocking on the doors of some of the top photo editors in New York, politely refusing to leave until they came out and looked at their work. John Morris was the picture editor at the New York Times. It seems so precocious for somebody 17 years old to get on a plane, first time he's ever been on a plane, fly to New York, and go to the head of Magnum, go to the photo editor of, of the New York Times, go and call on the best in the business. Well, it's, it's the kind of persistence and, that uh, they've shown ever since. I mean, they, nothing stops the Turnleys. They, they, they don't take no for an answer. Can you look at, at pictures that they've taken and, and tell which one took a certain picture? You can fool me almost any time. <laughs> <laughs> almost indistinguishable. I begin to notice some differences, but you're not going to get that out of me. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? I'll take the fifth. <laughs> They're competitive enough without having, uh, having some, a, a good old friend take sides. You think they are competitive? Oh, yeah. You bet. There was always fierce love and fierce hate. I mean, that, that was always there, you know. They got mad, and then they weren't supposed to fight anymore. And I've thrown a bucket of ice water on them in our living room to calm things down. Despite the competition, the Turnleys are smart enough to know that being twins has not hurt their careers. They published three books together and were recently honored with a joint exhibition at New York's International Center of Photography, entitled In Times of War and Peace. They work together, but they also work against each other. It's, it's funny to watch this in action. Tell me about it. Well, the trouble is they know each other so well that they, uh, each one can uh, guess where the other one's going to turn up. <laughs> And that makes them for some extraordinary circumstances. Take the Armenian earthquake in 1988, another two Turnley story. That year, John Morris headed the jury in the World Press Picture of the Year competition, the most prestigious award for news photography. Out of 10,000 entries from the world's best photographers, it came down to a choice between two pictures, this one and this one, both taken a few seconds apart at a gravesite in Armenia as a father buried his child. The jury was judging the pictures without knowing who the photographers were. The vertical really seemed stronger in composition, and I, th I think we made the right choice. Well, when they turned over the prints, and I found out that that was made by David and the horizontal by Peter, I almost died. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. When David got the call telling him that his photo had been selected picture of the year, he knew that his brother had submitted almost an identical photo and felt that he should be the one to give Peter the bad news. And there was a pause on the other end of the phone, and I'll always remember, and, and um, very touched by Peter's reaction, he said, well, listen, I want you to absolutely enjoy this moment. This is uh, a great success. And more than anything else, you've kept it in the family. <laughs> Were you disappointed? I suppose, to be frank, over the years, probably the most uh, irritating aspect of it was when young photographers would come up to me around the world and say, aren't you the guy that won the World Press Photo of the Year? And I knew that I had a picture just like it, and I'd tell them no, it was my brother. It takes more than a sharp eye and technical ability to be among the world's best photojournalists. You have to know where to be and how to get there, preferably first. 
Name a place in the world where there's news going on and the Turnleys know the next scheduled flight and every overland route. Mort Rosenblum, a correspondent for the Associated Press in Europe, thought for sure that he and his photographer were going to get a major scoop in Somalia. When the U.S. troops were rolling into Baidoa, I was there with an AP photographer, and we decided that we'd get ahead of this column of tanks, and we were going to be the first ones there. So we, we got this crazed driver, and he's crashing over stones and through grass and up hills and through sand and skidding around things. Pull out in front of this U.S. column, and we figure, ha, we, you know, we've got to be all alone here. Nobody else could be here. I look up, and there are two Toyota pickup trucks rolling along in front of the column, and there's a turnley in each Toyota. Um, they're amazing. I don't know how they do it. I do not know how they do it. Rosenblum thinks the key to their success is a combination of Midwestern charm and good manners combined with an infinite amount of tenacity. They figure out what they've got to do. They figure out where they've got to be. They figure out what they've got to spend. They figure out who they've got to be nice to. They figure out who they've got to kill. And then they just do it. Confronting war famine and human suffering on a regular basis is the most taxing part of the job. What keeps them going is the belief that their pictures can make a difference, that the world needs to know about the places they've been, and that photography is a voice to scream about everything they've seen. How emotionally involved do you get with what you're doing? I've been in, in the midst of, I think, some of the most difficult, dangerous situations you could imagine. I always feel that uh, I don't have to be there. No one has forced me to be there. If I can't keep it together and, and use that energy and that concentration and intensity to say something and to bring back uh, something people should see that I shouldn't be there. They will tell you that they can't possibly collect every human being who is suffering and drive them to the hospital. But there are times when they find it impossible not to become involved. Take the street battles in Haiti in 1994, after U.S. troops intervened. Here you see David in a blue shirt and a bandana over his head, alongside a gunman. A little later, a man was trapped on a porch and was then shot in front of a group of news photographers. And he lay there bleeding to death, but he was still breathing. And I jumped over the porch uh, with a colleague, Chris Morris, and we picked him up and carried him away. Um, it seemed pretty clear to me that whoever this man was, he's, he was still living and he needed some help. And, uh, you know, I suppose there are moments when, you know, for me, it's not about making a picture. If, if somebody needs help in front of me, I'll do all I can to help them. You go into people's lives at the, at the worst possible moment and take the pictures. You get on a plane or a helicopter and you leave and go off somewhere else, do you ever feel like you're exploiting people? Do you ever feel like you worry about exploiting people? I worry about it all the time. And if I think that there's a possibility of that, I don't make the pictures. But I think we cover so many situations where victims are pretty clear in their own minds that they are a product of a process of injustice, whatever that might be. And they want people to know that. They want people to see their suffering that they are somehow, for that moment, being considered, that their plight isn't going unheeded.